Right on. Thanks for coming in, everybody. Uh, we're glad that you can join us for a uh, talk with Mr. Peter Slayton, who works at the International Center for the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, which is in St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, we're talking today about what effect will a universe of virtual reality have on Christian churches? You may or may not be interested in the Christian church, but maybe you're interested in this, this, this metaverse stuff that's coming out. Um, but I want to know, and you might be able to help us out here with your comments if you enter some in here at the bottom, how will these two things interact? Will it be a good thing? Will it be, uh, will it cause some problems? So, uh, Peter, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I know you've been doing a little bit of the research here. Um, can you give us a brief sort of one minute definition of the metaverse as it's being <laughs> proposed? Sure. Well, the first thing I would say is the metaverse has actually been around for a while at this point. It's not a new thing, but when Facebook went live with changing their name to Meta, uh, what, last week, the week before, two weeks ago, I can't remember exactly now, it, it's it's going full-blown mainstream. And so now this is kind of, all of a sudden people are becoming aware of it that maybe weren't aware of it before. But the metaverse is kind of this, this combination this is my working definition. I'm sure there's others out there. Uh, feel free if you got a better one in the comments. <laughs> feel free to interact there too. Uh, it, it's this this combination of the real world, completely virtual worlds, and then there's this middle augmented reality um, world that you can have as well. All of it is mediated, mitigated via technology. So whether it's uh, goggles that you've got over your face where you're entering this fully VR world, whether it's your smartphone device that you've got where you're kind of holding up your camera and looking at the world and this is the augmented reality, there's additional things showing up on your screen in addition to what you're actually seeing there in the real world. Uh, it's, it's kind of all of these things put together in, in the metaverse. So the meta is supposed to encompass all of, all of this together and how they work together. Uh, the metaverse is not just the the real world, uh, real life analog, if you will. That's that's its own thing. It's really only the metaverse when you're bringing all of this stuff together via technology. Yeah, for so. sure. I know it, if you look at the Greek word meta, it just kind of means um, with. So I, I think if I'm right in-, in uh, You're the expert on that one, you tell me. <laughs> I think it's so metaverse is like this is you got your universe but then there's another universe that goes along with it it's not the same it's not sure. identifiable with this universe but it's something that goes with it and um the classic like what what we're seeing right now is perhaps what captures it is you can um live in a different house wear different clothes um have a different face you have a different face have it be yeah. a different animal or whatever you want um because you'd be pretending through technology, you'll be able to see it, hear it. Other, you can present yourself as this to other people, um, and so. Well, so 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 really quick though, that this is actually where it becomes this discussion actually becomes important because you use the word where you're pretending. Well, in the metaverse, they don't use language like that. They'd say, "No, you actually are." That is really? actually an instantiation of you in the digital universe. This isn't you pretending to be something online. This is actually another instance of you as an individual simply expressing yourself, perhaps in a different way, as you said, as a different species, whatever mm -hmm. it is. But this, the, the online presence that you create is actually part of you and who you are. So you're not necessarily pretending in, in the normal sense, the people who are all in on this would say, no, no, you're, that's actually you. This okay. is your, an avatar is a, is a language that would be used for the full blown version of, of you online in the metaverse, in all these different places where it can occur. So I just wanted to throw that out there because part yeah, of the important, sure. the important part of this conversation is the language that's actually being used around yeah. all this. And exactly. so I know that's where we're going to go. <laughs> yeah. You've, you've said that it's not, we Christians can understand technological advances as we have throughout the decades, centuries, and millennia. Uh, we see how that they can be put to good use and put to bad use. Mm -hmm. And that right now, what's upon us, what's on the horizon is um, it's not merely the technology which we ought to be concerned with, 
or perhaps it's not the technology in itself, but it's the language that comes with it. Can you expound on that some more? Yeah, that's where I would actually, where I want, I want to see more of our church body having the conversation around the language first. This, I, I'm not a anti-metaverse person. Maybe I will be. I don't know. I've I've done virtual reality goggles like three times. And so I have very limited experience. I can't say, oh, yes, I've been using this technology for hours and it's terrible. Nobody should ever use it. Th that conversation will be had. People are having it. There are experts out there who have studied it for hours and hours that are on different sides. I think as the church, the conversation we are equipped to have or should be equipped to have first is we need to talk about the language being used around this technology. So pointing out what you said about pretending and how, no, they use very different language. They're not pretending. When you're, you actually have you, when uh, Zuckerberg went, Mark Zuckerberg, when he did his presentation uh, last week, his hour and a half video, I've watched at least an hour of it. I've jumped around through a lot of it, watched the first bit of it. He talks about having, you know, when you buy something, online that it's actually yours and you can take it to different parts of the metaverse and carry it with you as if it's an actual thing that you have. I read an article uh, earlier this week uh, of an individual who's talking about your online persona, your avatar should actually be equal to your current one. So you, if you uh, buy a Ferrari in the metaverse, you should only be able to do that if you can actually afford a Ferrari in real life. So there's, there's very different ways of looking at this where they're saying, no, no, that's the real you out there. So much so that if you can't afford a Ferrari in real life, well, you shouldn't be able to afford a Ferrari in the metaverse. Um, mm -hmm. Now, of course, that's a completely different view of the metaverse than Zuckerberg is talking because he's like, no, 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 be anything you want in the metaverse and have all this kind of stuff. But just seeing how, how language is used, uh, the pretending one of the, I think, I think where I really keyed in on Zuckerberg's presentation, the first 20 minutes was just listening to the language that he uses as he talks about this. And then the language that the people in the video are demoing. So for example, you have one individual who is experiencing this concert and wants to invite her friend to come be a part of it and sends her this invite. And so the friend has her VR goggles and suddenly the avatar appears they're in the concert. The one girl is physically at the concert participating. The other girl appears virtually at the same concert. But the language used is, oh, you're here. As if like you're now physically here. It's the same language. So she doesn't, she didn't mean physically here. She actually just meant, you know, you're digitally here. But that that language of, oh, you're here, mm -hmm. that has shifted to where, no, now you're actually here. Whereas it's like, right. well, is she really there? Like, how is she there? What does this mean? Why mm -hmm. does it matter for us as church? Well, many of us, my congregation included, st uh, streams services online. And so sometimes I've caught myself saying, oh yeah, th we're here or they're here or using that same kind of language about somebody watching online. Uh, we could do the same thing with any audience watching right now. Oh, they're here. They're watching. They're with us. You know, we use this language so naturally now that my concern is, okay, as the church, we're already very easily slipping into that kind of language. What happens when virtual reality church, which by the way, already exists, it's already out there. Um, we have our own people directly involved in it, not to mention other non-denominational um, entities who are all in on this whole virtual reality church thing. Um, when, when that's where they want to go or where they are already going with this, you're here, you're present, you're a part of us, you're with us. In that context, when we're already using it in this little context here, well, what's that going to do to how we view church itself? Because the language we use actually changes the, how we perceive things and how we look at things. That's right. Um, and that's coming, this, yeah. <laughs> that's coming from you as a, a Lutheran Bible translator. Well, that's what I used to be. I used to work for Lutheran exactly. Bible translators. And so the linguistics of this, I mean, that, that's that's kind of, I'm an anthropology major. That's my training back in college. I took linguistics there, lived this overseas. And so looking at how people interact and how languages work has been a part of my DNA from 
you know, eight decades at this point. Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel old now. <laughs> um, so, so language matters. I mean, the words that we use definitely matter. And the, our language that we use does affect how we perceive the reality yeah. around us. And you just can't get away from that. That's, that's how it works. Uh, you can deny that and say, no, 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 no. One thing is, this is the objective thing. And that's like, no, look, just get over that. Language matters. How, yep. The words we use actually impact how we perceive things. Words and, how we per things. and it goes the other way too. The, 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 the way we perceive things will affect the language that we use around that thing. So if right. I am taught to perceive virtual reality as real, as just as real as everything else, which if you watch Zuckerberg's presentation, he's, he's literally saying those words. We want this to be just as real as everything else, as, as your real life. We want this to be just a part of it. We want, we want the sensations. We want the experience. I mean, he's you have a trillion dollar company, a business going all in on making this real and getting you to think that it's real and to perceive it as real. Well, mm -hmm. when that's constantly what you're fed, eventually you'll perceive it as real. How long did it take us to perceive our Facebook friends as real friends in the exact same way that we do our online friends, our, our real life friends? Didn't, yeah. didn't, take, that, didn't take that long. <laughs> that might hit a little bit close to home for some of us. Sure. I've met you in real life, though. We've hung out in real life, so, you know. Oh, for sure. Yes. It's different, right? And we've had table fellowship together. Exactly, yeah. Table fellowship. So, guys, if you're just joining us, if you're if you're just beginning to watch us, this is Peter Slayton, works with um, uh, social media strategy. I think you do some podcasting as well here and there, Peter. Yeah. Um, we're talking about how virtual reality, uh, as, it, as it appears to be at this point, how it will affect the church. Now, um, yes, you hit upon how we had this question of, are you really here in, and, and this, we're going to go right here, to the church. Mm -hmm. Are you really <laughs> here? When, of course, God. that's when you drop off, right? There. This is what it is. This is a part of the problem, right? <laughs> um, are you in the house of God um, with God's people? You had a wonderful question uh, in the messages earlier this morning where you said, who gets to define what is real? And that is of utmost importance if we are worshiping God. Yeah. Right? If we're worshiping God, we, uh, we must know that by faith that he is there. And we must know that what we are doing has his command and is pleasing to him because we come to worship to receive his gifts. It's his and, promises. I mean, the, the, things, the things he's promised to give us. We don't want to do anything and honestly this is unique to our lutheran theology in many ways because i see as i see other denominations having the same discussion they go in such a completely different direction with this and i think this is one of the reasons why we we believe teach and confess that god actually promises to give us things in the divine service that as as part of this he promises i'm going to forgive your sins i'm going to be there physically present in with and under those elements his very presence is going to be there um he's going to forgive our sins i said that again because he does it like several times you got the confession absolution you, you've got baptism all of these things that are tied up with the divine service he promises and we cannot do things in the context of the divine service. As we talk about the divine service, as we talk about church, we would just be foolish to do things that would introduce, well, is it really? Right. Exactly. It's, I, maybe, you know, I'm just not quite sure. And so at, at least as one starting point of this discussion, we can at least start with, okay, well, given what we believe about what God promises to do, are we sure we want to like introduce this entire new virtual reality and say, yep, that's part of the promise when we have no actual promise that says that's part of the promise. <laughs> so, so that, that's, that's one place to start. But I, I think even, even bigger, this is, this is a hermeneutic issue. How do we understand scripture? The, the, the understanding and interpretation of scripture. We have a, a particular hermeneutic where we actually want scripture to interpret scripture. We want God to define things for us. If we want to know when God says something, what does he mean? Well, we actually ask him what he means. 
a, mm -hmm. a great example of how we completely screw this up in our culture. I'll go with the negative example first. <laughs> is is when people say God is love. We all we all know that phrase. Our culture will even tell us God is love. And then what they'll do is they'll say, "Well, God is love." This thing that you're doing over here, your your belief that that homosexuality might not be the best way to go, it might not be part of God's plan, that's not a very loving thing for you to say. That doesn't make me feel loved. Therefore, you shouldn't say that because God is love. You should instead embrace. Well, what have we just done? We haven't had God define love. We haven't had scripture define love. We've defined it and then said, God, you have to act accordingly. This is how I yep. define love. This is how I experience it. This is what I think it is. When I read scripture and it says God is love, well, he has to do things my way. We're, we're at a point now where we're doing the same thing with church because of the language that we're using around church. Mm -hmm. what, what I'm seeing most commonly for the proponents of online church is totally church. Virtual reality church is totally church. They're both just as legitimate. Maybe they, they work a little bit differently, but as far as church goes, they're legitimate. The people who I see making those arguments, the most common way they're doing it is saying, well, scripture says gather together. Well, we're totally gathered together online. Pastor Doling, right now you and I are gathered together in this. Therefore, because scripture says gather, well, as we define gathered, we're definitely gathered. Therefore, this mm -hmm. is church. Well, mm -hmm. what have we done? We've actually used our current contemporary definition of gather and said, that's what scripture means. Therefore, this is okay. Yeah. And once it's, it's all back to the language we're using. Uh, that's it. And that, I see that. I'm like, okay, are we actually prepared? And then this is where I'm glad we're having a conversation <laughs> and where I think we didn't have more because are we actually prepared to answer that objection, to have that particular conversation? Do we realize that that's actually one of the places where this, uh, I don't know if battle's the right word, where this starts? Yeah, right. And uh, it, it took me, I had to really stop myself and think last night as I was preparing. I'm like, okay, is it a gathering when we are gathered virtually on Zoom or something? Mm-hmm. Am I ever going to stop saying, oh, uh, OK, they're here now because I just let them into the Zoom room? Right. Yeah. I don't know if I can get rid of that language right. um, very easily. But thinking theologically, you know, I, some of the things that um, examples I thought of regarding like how we tinker around with what God has uh, vouchsafed to us. He, he gives us his promises in a certain means and we tinker around with it. An example would be like. Um, the bread and wine in the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. People have said, well, we've invented grape juice now, and grape juice has perhaps some um, advantages over wine. So we're going to substitute the wine, which Christ used, and we're going to put grape juice in its place. And that's if, just if they'd even say we invented, they'd actually, once again, it's a language thing. They wouldn't say mm -hmm. we invented it. They'd say, oh, no, it, it was always that. It was always grape juice. I mean, once once again, our language matters. <laughs> yeah. Another really weird uh, connection, and someone else smarter than me might be able to shut me down on this one, but um, uh, in some churches they have, like, the, the images of the saints. Mm -hmm. And, the you know, there's, like, the gold backdrop, and it's, like, St. Abraham or St. Paul. Your and icon, that, the icons and stuff? Like icons that's what's yeah. windows into heaven. That yeah. uh, that this these saints can can be there to kind of um, assist in your devotion, but that's not in the Bible. Jesus never recommended this or even talked about this kind of thing. Sure, but we've decided that there's a there's a virtual presence there that you can either bring God into the room by means of an image or the Virgin Mary by means of an image, um, as if that's even a good thing to bring them into the room with you. But yeah, uh, through through those means. That's an interesting parallel to this sort of virtual, virtual reality through the screen that you know is a tinkering, of, uh, of the of the work of God. So that here's here's going back to what you said about, uh, you know, telling saying you're here with the Zoom meeting. That's mm -hmm. that's part of this, beginning this dialogue. I, that's that's a question I have. Okay, do we need to actually change what we say about that, 
or do we need to be way more intentional about recognizing the different uses of the word here, uh, the different uses of the word gathering? Because I don't, I don't think we're gonna. I, I don't think it's productive to fight against the culture and say, "Stop saying that's gathering. That's not gathering." Um, but there's, there definitely hat. I mean, maybe. And maybe we can actually win that one when it comes to church. And once again, I'm focused specifically on on church. If we're talking about a virtual meeting that I have at work with my coworkers, okay, yeah, we're going to definitely have some issues around what is real and what is not, and we can have that conversation. But the spiritual implications are a little further off <laughs> in that conversation. There's a few more steps to go um, in terms of the spiritual implications than the one specifically around church. But I wonder... Do we just need to, when it comes up, be intentional for a while and say, look, okay, you're here. But what I mean by that, or, or is that just going to get so annoying that people are going to be like, oh, right, stop right. it, whatever, whatever. Um, or is the fact that our people are going to say, oh, whatever, is that actually how we've lost some of this language and battles in the first place because we mm -hmm. got tired of repeating ourselves? I don't know. What do you, what do you think about how, how we actually start teaching our people about this the pointing out the difference um is it something we take time at the beginning of the live stream to say hey by the way you put up a little thing on the bottom a lower third that just goes yep. up is it I, I don't want to take bible study time to study something that's not the bible but maybe there's something there i don't know what do you think <laughs> well i uh i used to at the beginning of the pandemic kind of probably without without thinking too hard in the emails sending people out to to show to give them the link to live stream i'd say worship with us click here um few few weeks went by and i thought to myself that's not the right way to talk about this so sure. i changed it to uh view worship if if you can't join us view worship and i don't know if i'm not sure if anyone necessarily caught that or if that if that's if that's just too sneaky it wasn't very um It wasn't very explicit in teaching, but um, you know what I think we need to do is is people, even even in their daily lives, people are losing touch perhaps with um, the world of tangibles. And to mm -hmm. to, uh, to highlight like Jesus is a shepherd. One of the one of the main things that one of the main images of Christ, our Lord, especially with the preschoolers that I work with is Jesus holding a lamb. Jesus was a shepherd. What does that mean for this virtual reality conversation? Jesus as a shepherd, what does a shepherd do? He is with the sheep. He can attend to them. They can hear his voice. They can follow where he walks. He can, he can see which one is limping. He can see which one is uh, perhaps sick. And uh, what is the quote? I forget who said it, but a shepherd can even smell like a sheep. Mm -hmm. yep. And a flock of sheep bump into each other. They have to share. Um, they have to get along. Um, and all this stuff I see as if, if it is at all possible in the metaverse, in the virtual world, then it, it's totally changed in what it means. How can we smell like one another? How can a pastor know his people? Uh, in the same way, when you've opened up a, re a possibility of the people um, and the pastor presenting himself as something in addition to what he really is. And, not, and the, the togetherness of it. I mean, what does it mean when I can turn off my camera, mute my microphone and be doing whatever I want here? You know, reading a book, playing a game on my phone, maybe not even being physically in this room, but I walk away for a while, something I could never do when I'm actually sitting there in the pew. Well, I might be able to pull out my phone and look at it. That's it's still considered rude to do that unless I'm looking at the Bible or something. But, um, you know, a lot of different things. So it's like we all talk about, oh, you can go to church in your pajamas now. Um, I mean, that that fundamentally changes so many of it's what, what we think about church in and of itself. And so if we're talking about gathering together, being one, um, like you said, that being part of the flock, being with the shepherd, it's like, I don't even know how we can actually do any, any of those things. 
Uh, we ha we have uh, an interim pastor at my congregation right now, Pastor Joel Bierman, who's a professor at the seminary here in St. Louis. And he did two Sundays on what is the church and what are pastors. We're going through a call process, so he kind of took time to do that. Um, I was not there for the second week, but I commented to him how I loved how he started the first week, where he simply started with, okay, let's talk about what the church is. And he went somewhere. I have never heard any pastor go in scripture to actually begin to define the church. He went to Acts 9, Paul's experience on the road to Damascus. Now I might get some of these details wrong because I didn't like pull open my Bible and read this beforehand. Um, but, but as when Jesus confronts Paul, he says, that Paul says, who are you? And he says, I'm the one you're persecuting. Well, who was Paul actually persecuting? He was going into if I'm remembering correctly, where the Christians would gather, that's when he would go get them, right? He wasn't going to individual homes to pull them out of their individual, oh, you're a Christian, I'm going to pull you out and take care of you. No, he would go to where they were gathering together as the body, as church, and physically, that's, that's where he would meet them. Yep. Well, now Jesus says, you're persecuting me. The body of Christ, the church, Paul, when he was persecuting, was that physical gathering of people. And, and I love how it is so Christological. It's such a wonderful Christological way to begin our definition of, well, what is the church? Well, Jesus said it's his body. It's the ones that Paul was persecuting. These people physically gathered in one place that he was going to attack. That's the church. That's the body of Christ. Those ones. Okay, so we're starting with Jesus's actual words. He didn't say, this is what the church is, but given the context, scripture interprets scripture, that's, I, I love it because like, all right, we're, we're going to start our doctrine of the church with what Jesus says. And that's always a good move. <laughs> it's awesome. starting with what Jesus says. And, oh, look, this was a physical gathering together that Paul was going in on. That, yeah, should, and so much that should mean something to us in this day and age. Yeah, where, where are you going to say? Can trace Paul writes in, in like 1 Corinthians uh, that we are the body of Christ and that we are members of his body. Like there's one of you is the eye, one of you is the ear, one of you is the foot. He doesn't, he doesn't say that, uh, that one of you are one of those things. But right, right. Uh, this constant theology that we are not just sort of spiritually identifiable with Jesus, but that what his body underwent on the cross is what we undergo also by his grace. We participate in his sufferings on earth because we will participate in his resurrection. And that happens in the body. Mm -hmm. You know, the there's a lot of good stuff talked about in the past century about the theology of the body, mm -hmm. that we, we ought not um, disregard the fact that God has created the human body as an expression of what is already uh, in God's mind, an expression of something invisible. I mean, yeah. the, the soul and the body belong together and that I, I really cannot get away from this. As much as I might uh, wish I had a different body, wish I were taller, wish I were thinner, wish I were bulkier, um, there's only so much I can really do to modify that, and that is a gift of God. And 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 God Himself says, "Don't worry about those things. Exactly. I have given you what I have given you. Trust me." So even as we as humans look at all those things and say, "I wish this was different," God said, "No, no, no. I made you that way. This yep. is good. You are my child. My son died for you, and and this is a good thing." And so uh, so much of the the VR stuff is, is that desire to escape. So if we're going to start talking about the technology itself and, and it's connecting this to spirituality, well, that's one of those dangers. Uh, so much of this is I want to escape where I'm at. My identity in Christ is, I'm going to phrase this in a way that I, my, my identity in Christ is not sufficient. That thought is with us all the time. I mean, we are constantly struggling against that. So VR is not new. AR, augmented reality, is not new. Um, it's simply taking this, this um, dissatisfaction with who God has made me, and now I have a new tool with which to uh, 
<laughs> um, mm -hmm. indulge in this is in this sinful thought. So that's one of the negative ways, obviously, of of using that technology. Um, I forget where I was going with that entirely, but anyways, maybe that was just a rabbit trail. <laughs> I don't know. It's all right. Yes, uh, I've, I've taken a new interest in um, literally just snuggling with my kids. And even yeah. as even as um, my my son gets older, he's six now. And it, I was tempted to think, well, that's that's behind us now because he's a boy. He's getting bigger. Um, some of the reading I've done about about the brain mm -hmm. is especially I mean, throughout childhood and into the teenage years, that touch is required. That yeah. real human touch is part of what. Um, gives us that assurance that we belong here. We belong in this family. We belong in this world, such that so that we're not starved for uh, starved for human touch in perverse ways. Yeah. When the time comes for that to be possible, and yeah. um, I guess as you know, we we're seeing more of that data, but then you have like this opposite trend, which says uh, it might be cool for you just to live a life where you don't need that kind of touch. You don't need mm -hmm. that kind of community. And it's kind of hard to keep those two things together. That... Yeah, I, I mean, as as this conversation relates to the church, this, this was a big struggle within um, the congregation where I'm a member. So the, fir the first time my family and I were at home because there was no physical service to attend at, mm -hmm. our, at our church, there was simply the, on, the online option, I... I I wasn't entirely sure how to talk about it with my kids, but I did tell them, guys, we're not at church. We are currently not going to church. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I said, we're, we're hearing God's word. This is a good thing. You know, God's word is being proclaimed to us in some way. Although even that us Lutherans, the word proclaim, that's we're particular about that word. So I'm, I'm also careful with, well, is that proclamation supposed to be a physical here? I, I don't know. Um, I'm wearing KFU a radio t-shirt. I don't, I, that's you know one our radio station, and that's they're all about the proclamation. But even then, they're careful with how they use that word. Mm -hmm. So telling my kids we're not at church right now. This is this is what we have, and so we will appreciate it for what it is. But it's it's not church because um, my kids are like, well, what are we doing? Are we worshiping now? Are we going to church? You know, because we'd sit down. It's like, oh, church is about to start. And I'm like, well. Uh, Okay, I, I guess I don't know what else, what other phrase to use, so we'll go with that one. Yeah, so that that's the first instance of it. But then the second part within our congregation itself, there there came a strong move um, earlier this year in particular, where people were like guys, we just need to be together. Now we were already gathering back together physically, you know, so we had the church service, but we didn't have our normal fellowship hour. There wasn't the here's the time where we're just hanging out with each other and talking which isn't church in the technical sense, but our, our congregation still felt like this is an essential part of who we are as the body of Christ, that we need this fellowship with each other. We need to be able to just be with each other in physical proximity, or if somebody needs to give somebody else a hug, they can do that, or just look each other eye to eye and just spend that time together. Uh, and that's definitely a human need, but it was also something within the context of the congregation itself. People are saying, we need this. We need, and when it finally started happening, and here's the snacks, and here's the coffee, some of our members actually broke down crying because yeah. they were like, we needed this. We were missing this so badly. And um, I think I was, I was an elder at that point. I became an elder beginning of this year. And I brought that to our elders because the discussion was, well, should we continue the snacks? I'm like, yeah, we need to like this. Okay. The, the Bible doesn't say thou shalt have coffee and donuts, you know, during the Bible study hour, but man, our congregation clearly needs it. Like, yeah, and it's, I mean, it's, it's not about the donuts. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the example, though. Jesus is yeah. he teaches at the table and he goes to eat with his students or his enemies, even. He eats with them as a show of, you know, we're human together and we love each other. Yeah. So we're so this is to the table. Th this this is where the, the VR comes in, the metaverse comes in and becomes important again. Because if you listen to Mark Zuckerberg and you listen to other people who are really proponents of this technology, who are really pushing it forward, everything that they're doing is with the goal of you being able to feel just as if you are there 
<laughs> so that the metaverse, you know, he, he, he explicitly talked about having an avatar that actually physically looks completely like you, you know, and improving the technology to a point that it is like a photo realistic, video realistic version of you walking around that room, working on sensory perception things. So when I say our people, you know, we had members who broke down crying because they were finally able to be there with people. The response of the metaverse you know, all in proponents says, oh yeah, we'll get there. Don't worry. We're, that's what we're working on five years from now, 10 years from now, you know, you put on your VR gear, whatever that looks like and step into your church. You'll have all those exact same feelings. You'll actually have the, the feedback, the, the tactile haptic feedback, tactile feedback, whatever, whatever the technical proper term is for it of actually being there physically present with that individual you'll be able to put your hand on their shoulder and they'll feel it you'll be able to wrap around and give them a hug you'll have the smells of the food you know you can mimic drinking coffee it, like that's the goal that's where mm -hmm. they're going and so even as we're sitting here today saying that's not real we can't do that well but the technology will get there yeah they're, they're saying try, they're trying to get it there the best they can <laughs> <laughs> which someday, is why which is why I'm like we got to talk about the language now people. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I just want more right, of our part, church part to of talk whole, about this. Yeah, go ahead. Part of what's going on of course is um something that Facebook has already been and online media has already been is that the people you can be with the people that you choose to be with. Um and there could be like 25 of you in the entire world mm -hmm. because you all like this brand of um, snack or whatever that could be your community and uh, that's a very different um, model of existence than what you find if you just look out your window if you look mm -hmm. out your window those are your neighbors your neighbors are the people who might have none of the common interests that you have jesus says love your neighbor and so the church continues to be, I mean, how often is it, if people are being honest, that one of the reasons they don't they don't want to attend a church is because of other people? I, I know people who have explicitly said that. I, I have friends who for a time stopped going to church and they explicitly said, look, I just, I don't want to see those people. I right. can't handle those people. I love church. I'm a Christian. I, I, I understand what I receiving God's gifts when I'm there. I understand what I get, um, what God wants to give me, his promises. I get all that. I just don't want to be around those people. I can't yeah. take it. So yeah, that's <laughs> this isn't <laughs> hypothetical. I know people who have like that's it. <laughs> yeah. And boy, isn't that like that's the point, my friend? <laughs> right. uh -huh. Yeah, God, you know what? God's gonna shape you through that trial. Maybe he's you know working on you in some way that He's, he's helping you work through some issues there. <laughs> yeah. This, I mean, this. if Jesus, Jesus comes down from a place of bliss and heavenly glory, and he comes down here where the people treat him really badly. Yeah. But he wants to found a church. And so that's that's the model we have is go to the yeah. people and be with them. Um, and let's all let's all pray together. Yeah. I th this. What's interesting, you talk about who who your neighbor is. I wrote an article for the Lutheran Witness a couple years back about loving your digital neighbor. Um, I need to go yeah. back and reread that now and see, huh, did I start falling into this trap that I'm now more aware of? Or what, what, did I nuance it enough where it's like, because I know one of the main thrusts is, look, don't be a jerk online. There's actually a real person on the other side of your keyboard, on the other side of that screen. So I know that was... A major theme of the article, but I'm I'm wondering now, huh? Did I go too far with the neighbor metaphor? Is is there? Did I miss something? And now it's like I got to rethink this. Hmm. I think I might actually have that article over here. It'd take me too long to go through it, but um. Anyways, it's interesting. Now it's like, huh? I wonder if my own words are going to come back to haunt me. Uh, we're, but we're dealing we're dealing with this even on LCMS social media. So I'm the social media manager. My my regular day job is social media manager for the LCMS. And we're now starting to shift how we post prayers. Um, not necessarily the weekend ones yet, although now I'm thinking, okay, eight o'clock central time tonight, the the collects, the prayers of the church are going to go up. Those go up every Saturday. They have for six years now. That's like a normal thing. Uh, but like when we posted our 9-11 
uh, the, the colic that went up for 9-11 or a disaster thing like that. It used to be that we just pray with us. Here you go. Here's a prayer. Well, now we're starting to rethink, wait a minute. When we do that, are we teaching people who follow the page that clicking like is praying or that when we post that prayer and they read it, that that's the exact same thing that God intends when he talks about prayer? Or are, are we doing something like, hey, everybody who shared this, who liked this, who commented, we're all now praying together. Remember, now we're getting back to this gathering together language. And we said, you know what? We actually want to start changing how we do that. So if you go back to 9-11 um, on the Facebook feed, you'll see we actually introduced that with, this is a collect um, that we have that we're offering up for you to pray in your personal devotions, uh, your family devotions, uh, church Bible study, your, your small group. And you're actually listing physical gatherings of places where this, this is where Christians pray together in the way God intended, trying to start moving even how we post on social media away from language that could imply or directly straight up says, you know, just clicking like is, is a prayer um, to, hey, when Christians pray, it's in a context. The collect of the church is in the context of the divine service. So if we offer up a collect, like the prayers of the church that go out in a few hours here, those are actually intended for the context of the divine service, where they will be prayed when you're together physically as a congregation. Um, so we're starting to think, okay, how are we doing this online? And then this goes right back to, okay, we're also streaming chapel every day. And we're starting to have the conversation. Well, several people have tried to start the conversation. We we need to like continue it. What are we doing? Because um, we have people watching that live stream who will explicitly say, thank you for letting me worship with you today. I can't go to church, but I can get this every day. And it's wonderful. And it's like, did we just replace somebody's church? Well, that's that's not good. First of all, we're not a congregation. It's <laughs> so that's 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 a problem theologically in and of itself. If people are taking us to be church when it's simply a chapel service provided for the employees at the international center that we also um, live stream, but even even in those contexts, we're, we we got to start being more clear and thinking through what is it that we're actually doing. Uh, once again, back to the, the impetus of this conversation is because what we're doing now in those contexts will teach people how to talk about virtual reality. Because if we say this is real, there's no way we can say virtual reality isn't because it's going to feel even more real. You're even more present in that digitally than you can be in where we are now. So this, the conversation about what we do with our live streams now actually has massive implications for that future you know, virtual reality stuff, how, how we talk about it. Mm -hmm. That's good. It's, it really is amazing to think, I mean, it's multiple times in this conversation, I've thought, yeah, these are, these are things that not only have we not, have I not thought about them before, but I immediately see how I'm going to be thinking about them over and over and over and over and over again. And, yeah. <laughs> and Christians, Welcome to the last like couple of weeks of my life where I'm like, Okay, my brain is going crazy now. What do we do yeah. with this? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's good. And but you know what? Um, one way to look at this is sort of, you know, um, logically is, yeah, we may we may continue to have new things like online church, virtual church, but you'll always still have in person or real people gathering together, receiving the Lord's body and blood. You'll always still have it. Mm -hmm. And it will always be um, in play. It does make you ask, then then do we, I'm not sure how to finish that. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, if there's a point where perhaps the government steps in and says, no, you're not allowed to do that anymore. Well, as mm -hmm. Christians, we actually say, no, we actually need to this that, that's right exactly. god, god actually commands us to gather together this is how he has organized his church is for us to physically gather together in that way and so whatever reason the government might give for why we can't maybe we need to start saying um we're going to and yeah. we will have to deal with the consequences of 
whatever those consequences may be, that's that's where the rubber will hit the road. Because I think, well, I mean, just look at the last year and a half. This, the, this, this now gets personal and this gets very hard because we've all made different decisions um, in the midst of all of this. Um, but once again, I think so much of that is like, okay, if we had spent the time to talk about it and to talk through some of these things, maybe we could have made better ones. Um, and now, all right, we've got, we've, now's the time. Let's talk. <laughs> so the sure. next time it happens, yeah. next time it happens, we're better prepared to make uh, better decisions, if you will. Yep. And yeah. you're right. We might, we might not see that kind of um, heavy handedness outside of, outside of what has happened with, with public health concerns. Yeah. Um, and then we, you know, a lot of us, we were all convinced that, mm -hmm. uh, yes, it would be better for us to stay in. Um, I just, I looked to a lot of my friends, a lot of men who I trusted, a lot of pastors, when I saw they were doing the same thing, they were saying, let's going to have online church or we're going to do it online or whatever. Um, and so we, we realized that was the right thing to do. Perhaps give it to God, let, let him do with it what he will. He forgives yeah. us, yeah. affirms us, whatever that is. We don't know. But, um, but you can think like in places like, Egypt or China, where you really cannot gather as as a body confessing certain things. And they still do. And they, they do. And they, <laughs> they I've heard one friend of mine from Egypt said that's what he prefers because he prefers um, a contrast that clarifies what is what is important. Yeah. What we, what are you yeah. willing to risk or die for? What 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 I taught my kids and what I've as I've had this conversation with other friends and pastors and coworkers is it is worth risking death to receive what we receive from God Sunday yep. mornings. And, and that needs to be our perspective, whether or not we actually believe we're risking death. Uh, some of us do, some of us don't, but either way, the perspective should be, it's worth it the eternal life that we are promised once again. And this, this is why going back to the very beginning of our conversation, inserting doubt into this is one of the worst things you can possibly do it's because we'll, yeah, it's, yep. it's, it's, it's demonic yep. like this, yep. this, yeah, we'll, we'll just be straight up about that. Um, inserting doubt into this. It's like, no, if, if God has promised eternal life, if, if, when we, I'm trying to think of the, the words after, after we've received the supper, um, preserve you into in the one true faith unto life everlasting. If we believe that's what God actually gives us, that's what he actually does in, in the Lord's Supper, that when the pastor says, I forgive your sins, as a call and ordained servant of the word, I forgive your sins, that, that's actually happening, that he's actually forgiving our sins. I'm actually receiving that. You know, that when the baptism happens, my children are actually saved. Like this is actually something, God is doing something all of these things because he promised this is what I'm going to do. We can't entertain anything that would cause anybody to doubt. We also don't want to entertain anything <coughs> that would cause people to say, uh, I don't know if I really want to be there. Mm -hmm. Actually, I just, I realized I just actually made the opposite argument there because that is what people have said. I'm not sure I want to be there. But the reason they don't want to be there is I'm worried about what I might catch by being there. And so we've got both sides of the catechesis there as what's actually important here. We, we don't want to cause people to stumble in such a way. It's like, well, I'm worried about what I might get. But we also need to teach them um, it's worth risking death to be here. In the midst of that worry of what might happen to you, you also need to understand and believe that it's worth it either way being here is worth it. Um, so if we're talking about the virtual reality again, okay, there's another pandemic. Virtual reality is even more robust. It's even more available. What we're going to see is the church itself, the visible church saying, all right, everybody, we're going virtual again because that was just as good. And here we are, LCMS Lutherans, who like to be sectarian, being like, ah, uh, not, not sure that's the good thing. Yeah. <laughs> assuming we've had this conversation well and i that sounds so bad to say it that way because obviously i've already got my conclusions um but honestly i think scripture is clear about this kind of stuff it's not that hard thank you for bringing um some of your expertise into this question peter thank you for um 
bringing Christ always into this matter as well. That's what matters. Uh, yep. If you've been able to view uh, our talk today, we say thank you for joining us. Uh, this has been Peter Slayton, who works at the International Center, headquarters of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod for Social Media Strategy. Um, and look him up on Facebook if uh, you want to learn more. Um, I usually uh, don't friend people that I don't know. So you can come hang out in different Facebook groups with me. But if I don't know you, him, I, guess, then. I, I don't accept Facebook friend requests from people I haven't actually met in real life. So I'm trying to be consistent about this stuff. Right. If I haven't right. actually met you in real life, it's like, ah, sorry, man. Uh, but you want to yeah. hang out in, in different groups, um, you can go to the Grok Moot, um, G-R-O-K-M-O-O-T. That's one nice. of the Facebook groups that I run. We spend time talking about Jesus. We do uh, we, we stream Bible studies on YouTube, and it goes into there. And so you want to hang out with me, that's that's actually the place to, to do it. Look at that. Hang out. Look at this. I... I I'm doing it myself. Come hang out with me at a Facebook group. Oh. What's that group called again? I can put it up on the on the screen. The Grok Moot. So it's part of a uh, Crucial Grok. Production. Yep, G R O K M O O T. So Crucial Productions is a recognized service organization that I run uh, on the side with one of my good friends and coworkers. And the Grok Moot is our Facebook group where we talk about stuff. Yep, there's there's a space in between the, the and Grok Moot, but you should be able to find it sure. either way. Yeah, I just realized we have virtual reality misspelled on our bottom scroll thing. And I noticed that like 30 seconds ago. I'm like, oh, no. Well, uh, that's that's uh, that's him. I'm, I'm like. sure I'm sure it's an object lesson in some way about yeah. about this conversation. So somebody can make it a well, metaphor. I'm glad you pointed that out. <laughs> well, thank you again, Peter. Uh, God yeah. bless you and your family. I hope that uh, you continue to. Uh, excel at what you're doing for the service of the church and our Lord Jesus Christ. We we'll hope to talk with you again later. Yeah, well, thank you for your frontline service there as a pastor. It's it's truly appreciated, and we'll pray for your family as well. Thank you, Peter. We'll All see right. you again. I'm going to end it today. Have a All day. right, you as well.